Self-driving cars are no longer a thing of the future, and we could be seeing more of them in the years to come. November's issue of Car and Driver looks into the race to get driverless cars onto the streets. The 31-page special report highlights the advances car companies are making and why some people want to put the brakes on the technology. We are happy to welcome back Malcolm Gladwell, host of the Revisionist History podcast, joining us here on set. Welcome back. Thank you. So, all right, what did you discover in editing this issue that you're, that you're holding right there uh, on driving cars, on driverless cars? The issue is a lot more complicated than I had imagined. I mean, like everyone else, I'm a, I'm a car nut myself, but I had assumed this stuff was around the corner and inevitable and um, relatively straightforward. But in fact, there's a, a couple of the pieces in here um, really go into the, what we have to think through before we can get to the stage um, that we have autonomous cars. And secondly, do we actually want them? <laughs> I mean, which is another question. thing which so many people are sort of assuming that this is the way we ought to go. And this issue, is a, in, a, in, a, in a couple of key moments, it says, now, wait a minute, let's think about the implications. Hmm. Um, and they're considerable. So what are those things? I mean, we, we just read this lead in saying they're coming, they're here, they're basically <laughs> on the roads. And you're like, yeah. Well, here's a simple one. One of the best pieces in the issues by Tom Vanderbilt. Um, uh, and he writes about the kind of the safety questions. So if I'm driving my car and I get into an accident and something happens, I'm responsible or if I hit you, you're responsible. And we feel about... Uh, mistakes or errors or accidents um, one way when human beings are involved. If you're in a car where you've surrendered control to a machine and an accident happens, you feel very differently about what happens. You may be far more risk averse or far more upset by something going wrong if you've surrendered control to a machine than if you were in charge yourself. So it's not the case, it's not enough to say there may be fewer accidents if we go to driverless cars. The real question is, how will we feel about the accidents that happen once we've handed over uh, control to a machine? Yeah. And what if the nature of the things that go wrong when machines are in charge is fundamentally different from, what if machines kill different kinds of people under different kind right. of circumstances? Right. Under, you know, so it's, it, it sort of gets, and then there's a piece on the security aspect of this, which I, to my mind is maybe the most important thing. It opens up a whole new area of crime that if a car now is uh, is being run by a comp by a, you know is on the web essentially, right. what does the history of the last two or three years tell us? That every single major company organ of government has been hacked by somebody. So now your car is being thrown into the right. equation. I mean, all kinds of so there's all these questions that that really have to be answered before we can go forward. You know, uh, what is the biggest challenge though in getting this technology to the masses? The challenge is working out our feelings about it, is solving the security issues, and most importantly, getting cars to the point where they actually, I mean, let's be clear, one of the, one of the that we have trillions of uh, person hours of experience with cars and a hundred years of experience with, with conventional cars. We've only tested autonomous vehicles the tiniest fraction of that much time. You need to have a car for an autonomous vehicle to, vehicle to behave intelligently in a, on a roadway requires that computer to have seen and understood literally millions of different um, uh, scenarios, right? So if you think about you're driving down the, uh, a residential street, you see a kid playing ball on a driveway, and you see the ball slip past the kid, right? And the driveway may be a long driveway. You've seen that scenario you instinctively slow down because you think, wait a second, there's a chance the kid might run under the street. Right. Does the autonomous vehicle make that sophisticated? It's a social calculation. You make that calculation because you have children and you've seen them play. Right. I mean, and I, you've I, I been can, a child. And you've been a child, <laughs> Rolled right? a ball out into a street. You can almost, or see, it. Yeah. You can almost see it as, uh, that's a great analogy, where if there's a ball that bounces out into the street, do you calculate... Do I slow down? Do I speed up because I think the kid's far enough away that yeah. he's not going to race into the yeah. street and I can get around the ball? Yeah. Do I swerve around it? Do I go left? Do I go right? The question I have, though, would it make sense to plan communities around the idea of driverless cars? Just like when we were kids, we had these like Tyco uh, car sets, that, these racetracks, and they were powered by an electrical system on the track. And yeah. we, it's not a question of the calculations the vehicle makes. It's just a, a function of the, the electrical currents that would 
maneuver the car through yeah. a planned community. So this is a yeah, this is a really interesting point that one of the uh, possible scenarios here is we divide up the world, and there are certain spaces where we go where everything is autonomous, mm -hmm. and we hand over control to the central, <laughs> you know, driving server. <laughs> and then there are other areas where we maintain control ourselves, where we think it's more appropriate. We haven't even talked about pleasure. I have to be someone that gets a great deal of pleasure from driving a car. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and then there are many, many people who subscribe to magazines like this yeah. who feel the same way. Are we going to just walk away from something that's brought us so much joy over the years? I'm not sure we are. Yeah, there's so much emotion, I think, connected to uh, the liberty of driving and the mastery of this mm -hmm. huge machine, you know, being the person that's controlling it. And, you know, you mentioned, do we even want this? Right. And that's yeah. the question, because we are sort of giving up more than just our, uh, or maybe we're giving, more than giving ourselves like maybe free time. Now we don't have to worry about actually driving. We're giving up stuff to mm -hmm. get into this autonomous car. Yeah. Yeah. You write a great article where you say, hey, it's not really truly autonomous either. It's dependent on something else. It's yes. just not dependent on <laughs> us. Oh yeah, I object to the term self-driving car. Yeah. The self-driving car is the car that's driven by yourself. That's what we have now. <laughs> this is a car that is, and is also not autonomous, this is a car that is linked into a system. The autonomous car is the car we have now. The one we're giving up that in favor of is the car that is um, embedded in a complex network controlled by someone we can't see. Mm. Right? Yeah, that ain't autonomy. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Malcolm Gladwell, always good to have you. Thank you very much for stopping by. Pleasure being the new issue of Car and Driver is out. Emory's already got a copy hot off the presses. Mm -hmm. There it is. Take it out. <laughs> Thank you very much, Malcolm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>